All right. So we're taking our real estate license for the state of Colorado. And what we know is that we have two parts because we hold the highest licensure in the United States. We get to do a national piece, which consists of 80 questions. And we get to do a state piece, which consists of 74 questions. And today we're truly going to talk about the national piece. So we're going to go through the, the national exam and we're not going to cover everything. We're going to cover four of the big pieces, though. And if you are wanting to kind of see what the test consists of and you're wanting to scan that QR barcode right there, that will actually take you to PSI and it will show you what the topics are and, you know, kind of how I gathered some of this information. Um, or if you don't have a, you know, a phone handy or if you're on your phone, what this would look like is just Google PSI Colorado Candidate Bulletin and it will pull that information up. So... We are going to go over four topics. We're going to go over financing, general principles of agency, contracts, and practice of real estate today. And so if you're, if you're looking at this, this is what, 20, 30, 40, 53%. 53% of your um, information that you're going to be having to be quizzed on, we're, this is what we're going to touch today. And yes, there's going to be things like the real estate calculations, and there's some other high... Um, counts that there are and this will all live in that study guide that i've been talking about that study guide is right now in the facebook group that we are all a part of that k score colorado and again i will re-upload it just so that it can everyone can see it and just grab this because what this has done is essentially it's taken all of the information that we've been learning in that that big book and it has just broken it down to truly just the concepts so let's get this thing going. When we're talking about agency, right? This slide, what we're looking at is agents and agency termination. So for the exam, we need to know that there's three different types of agents. We have a special agent, a general agent, and a universal agent. Now, when you hear uh, special or specific, I just want you to think of a regular real estate agent. This person is that one that helps you buy or sell one, two, three Main Street. They're not doing anything else except for just like what all of you are getting your license to do is help people buy and sell. Then we have a general agent. And this general agent, I want you to think of a property manager. Yes, they're dealing with one, two, three Main Street. And they might actually be collecting the rents. They might be calling for the uh, inspector to come out. They might be calling for the contractor to come fix something. They might be um, removing and bringing in new tenants. This is a general agent. And then we have universal agent. This is just someone that has POA, power of attorney. And uh, what I like to think about this is this is maybe a real estate agent that you've given power of attorney to sign for you. But let's just say that you're big into investments. And this is an agent that you have said, hey, if this meets my criteria, I don't even want you to send it to me. Just sign my name on this contract and I'll fund it. So special agent, 123 Main Street, regular real estate agent. General agent, I want you to think of a property manager. And our universal agent, I really want you to think of someone who has power of attorney. Then we've talked about this. This is how the agency termination, right? This is where the agency agreement terminates. So the very first one is death of the client or the agent. And for the agent, I want you to think of the broker, right? Because we're designated agents, right? And so a designated agent means that the broker has said, you will help this person buy and sell one, two, three Main Street. It doesn't matter where the relationship comes from, right? This could be your best friend from high school. This could be your spouse. This could be even be yourself. The managing broker, though, is the one that designates you to help this person. So either the managing broker passes away or the client passes away, the agency's terminated. Expiration. We know that all contracts have a definite start date and a definite end date. So if the contract, the agency agreement ends, then the contract terminates. Impossibility, right? Like if the house goes up in smoke, right? And the house goes and it gets burned down to the ground. 
well, we're probably not going to be able to sell that house, right? In the in the way that we actually set up the contract, right? Because we're going to do a four bedroom, three bath home that was 2,500 square feet. It doesn't mean we can't write a new contract to sell the land. And we're not going to be able to sell the house the way that the contract was written. So the contract would terminate. And um, you, your other one would be, you know, if the agent or the client is mentally unable or even bankrupt, right? We're incapable, it, where you're actually in capacity um, to be able to go do something. Performance, where we just say that, hey, you know what? We did what we were supposed to do, right? I helped you buy 123 Main Street. I helped you sell 123 Main Street. And the contract was completed. Then we have uh, rescission is the other one that I want you to think about. And the rescission piece is just where both parties decide to let each other out. I think those are going to be the ones that you're going to be hit with the most for the agency termination is um, those death, expiration, impossibility, incapacity, performance, and rescission. I think those are going to be your big ones. And the rescission, again, it's just where both parties decide that like you don't want to work with one another anymore. Maybe you have a seller that won't let you host the open house or not let anyone in. So you might get to the point where that person isn't making your job easy. And you're like, I don't want this stress in my life anymore. And they decide they're like, cool, like you're not a great agent either. And you both decide to let each other out of the contract. That is how you would get to these. So agency and agency termination. Here's some of the words that I think are going to be important to know. Buyer's agent, right? This is truly the person that represents the buyer. And there are enough places where this exists to where they actually had to create a second uh, subset of agency, which was this buyer agent. They only represent the buyer. When you see listing agent, that is the person that represents the seller. So they're talking about the listing agent. That is the person that has the listing and they represent the seller. Now, this one's a little bit confusing. The selling agent. The selling agent is actually the agent who has the buyer again, right? So the selling agent is the agent who obtains a buyer. So buyer's agent and selling agent are essentially the same thing. And listing agent is the one that represents the seller. Then when we have is this designated or split agency, right? And this is just where there are two agents in the same brokerage. So it says two agents from the same office with separate clients involved with the same transaction. One agent's representing as the listing agent and the second is as the buyer's agent. So I want you guys to know this is perfectly legal. If you're in a brokerage, both uh, agents that are in the brokerage right on a multiple person firm it is perfectly legal for them to be a part of the same transaction representing two different parties. And I think you will see a test question around that. And then we have a sub agent and the sub agent on the national test. This is just a salesperson that works for an agent. So this is a salesperson that works for the person who has a client. Now, since we're talking about the national exam, we have single agency and we have dual agency. So what this looks like is this, we have a client or principal that we represent as an agent. All right, so single agency means that I have a client or principal, which means the exact same thing. And we represent them as an agent. The other party to the transaction we represent them with no representation. We treat them as a customer though, all right? So I don't care if this is a random person off the street that does not have uh, representation or this person actually does have representation from another person, we treat them as a customer, which means we owe them reasonable care, fair and honest dealings and disclosure of material facts. That is all we owe them. So. Your test might ask you the, the third party to the transaction, right? The other party, that's your customer. Or if they're unrepresented, they're also your customer. Then what we have is dual agency. Dual agency 
on the national exam is perfectly legal. Firstly, we have to get both parties, the buyer and the seller, to consent that we can both we can rep represent them both as agents, um, and they have to have mutual knowledge, right? Like we have to share everything that we know with everyone, and they actually have to consent for this relationship to be in existence. So we have the buyer who we re represent as an agent. We have the seller that we represent as an agent. They are both our client. They are both our principal. And in the national exam, this is perfectly legal. When we dive into it a little bit more, this is what agency looks like. And this is where I think it gets a little bit weird, especially when we start talking about dual agency. So we have to give confidentiality. Like we can't disclose anything that is going to um, you know, hurt our client. We have to give them reasonable care. We have to make sure that everything is happening um, in a controlled manner in the way that we can control it. Loyalty, we want them to win. We need to fight for them. Accountability, we have to know where their money is at all times. And the disclosure of material facts about the other party. So if I know that if I represent the seller and I know that the buyer just declared bankruptcy or lost their job, I must disclose that to my seller. So if I know anything about the third party that is going to benefit or potentially hurt my seller, I must let them know. So confidentiality, care, loyalty, accountability, and disclosure of material facts about the other party is what I owe my client. And so if you look at this, it's, a, it's this COALD, right? C-O-A-L-D. And so you might get a test question around like, what do you owe your principal or client? If it doesn't fall into these letters, um, it's wrong, right? They're gonna say, which one of these do you not owe to your client? Well, if, it, if it's any other letter, I think that's pretty safe. I would just line up with these. Then we have the transaction broker. And we know in the state part of the test, we can't be agents. And if we're going to help both party, we can't be dual agency. We have to drop down to a transaction broker status. So you'll also be quizzed on the national piece around a transactional broker. This person's not an agent. They have no fiduciary relationship, right? They don't owe confidentiality, care. They don't owe loyalty. They don't have to account for anyone's money. They don't have to disclose about the other party. They don't represent anyone. They are a facilitator. They are working on the paperwork. They work for the transaction. They work for the contract. That is all they work for. They are a paper pusher. Any negotiations are done directly by the buyer and the seller. And really what that just means is the buyer says what they want, and you go tell the seller. The seller says what they want, you go tell the buyer. And they say, well, what do you think? I think that you should probably consult with a lawyer because I am not your agent. So I cannot give you uh, any of this care or this, this loyalty that you're looking for, right? So you're going through paper pusher, you're Switzerland, no fiduciary responsibility. And your fiduciary responsibility, again, it lives on this left-hand side. Then an agent works for the client, right? If you're an agent, you work for the client. And that means that the other party is a customer to you. There is a fiduciary responsibility between the agent and the client and you owe honesty, fairness, and disclosure of material defects to the customer. And again, the customer can be an unrepresented party or they're represented by the other agent. So that's 13. Yes. Yes, Alyssa. I learned old car in Kaplan, old car, and then D car for transaction on a broker, and then D A C H for customer. This is kind of different. Yeah, there's so many different acronyms to help you, right? I think it's. Yeah, there's also AC cold, right? There is so many different ways to get go around this thing. I think that if you're just going in here, these five are going to be your big five. And then the customer thing 
it, it's really really just honesty, fairness, and a disclosure of material uh, defects. Disclosure. I think that, yeah, according to that maybe disclosure, honesty, confidentiality, and accountability to a customer. Is that no, no, no. You're not you're not accountable to a customer. No, there uh, is no oh. No, so that's the thing. You don't owe a customer anything. You cannot lie to them. You're, that's the honesty part. Like you can't just lie to them. Um, you have to treat them fairly, which just means like if you're not doing anything to hurt your client, you can help them. And what I mean by help them is just like, here's the paperwork. Is there anything else you need from me, right? Like you're not giving them any tips because that's a fiduciary responsibility that you only owe to a client. And then we know that we have to disclose material defects. Like we owe that to everyone. Like if we know something, I don't care if it's going to hurt our client, we must disclose it. The roof leaks, there is settling in the foundation and there's a big crack on the floor. Like if we actually know this, not if we think it, but if we actually know it, we must disclose it. They, okay. They said disclosure, honesty, and maybe it's accounting. Does that make sense? D A H. No, we, would, no. we wouldn't know accounting either because accounting That's means how that they we teach it. I didn't, they teach it different, but that's yeah, fine. We, and then, yeah, you said you yeah, had we, a worksheet for this. Yeah. Yep. There's definitely a, a worksheet and I'll make sure to, um, to get that over to you guys in the Facebook group when we're done here. Okay. So I'll just, I wrote down your way and they have their way. I don't, whatever's on the test is what matters. Yeah, absolutely. This will be on the test. I promise you, like this is, this is the way to remember it. Okay. So that's 13%, right? Like, and I think if we walk away with these principles and just have an understanding around them, guys, I think that the, the agency part of the, um, the national is going to be really simple. And a lot of these principles minus dual agency go over to the state piece and minus salesperson. We don't have salesperson for associate brokers in the state. So transaction brokerage, customer, uh, this, uh, the fiduciary responsibilities, like all of those a single agency, buyer's agent, listing agent, the, the, designated agency, all of those will also translate into the state piece for you as well. So then we have contracts and contracts is big, right? Contracts is massive on the national portion as well as the state. And there's a lot of these pieces that are going to um, coincide back and forth. So the very first piece to have as an essential element to a contract is we have to have competent parties. All the parties must be mentally competent and of legal age, right? That's a competent party. Then we have to have a lawful object, right? And for the most part, you know that we're talking about real estate. And so a real estate piece is a, a legal thing that we can actually sell. Now, if the, the buy side of this has some illegal component behind it, then it wouldn't be a legal contract, but we know that a house is, is legal. We, we can make a contract. Meeting of the minds. And so what meeting of the minds for us means there's offer and acceptance. All right. One party, the offerer, typically the buyer and the seller is the offeree. And so when we have this meeting of the minds, this offer and acceptance typically is done in writing, right? And then we have an executed contract, right? Then we have consideration or an executory contract. I'm sorry, the executory. So then we have consideration, a promise or an exchange for one thing or another, right? Like if I give you money, you will give me the house and written. Not all contracts are required to be written. Some of them are verbal, but as we're talking about the statute of frauds, and we'll talk about that here in a moment, the statute of frauds means that for anything to be legally enforceable, it must be in writing. So we have competent parties, a lawful object, meeting of the minds, consideration, and it must be written. These make a valid contract. All right. That has all the essential elements. And so this contract's binding and enforceable. What makes this contract void is one of these pieces missing. If there wasn't a competent party, if it wasn't written, 
if there wasn't a meeting of the minds, if there wasn't consideration, right, this would void your contract. I also want you to know this. When we're talking about the lead-based paint disclosure, the lead-based paint disclosure is, is necessary for the contract to be uh, valid. So if the home was built, right, and it is necessary for there to be a lead-based paint disclosure attached to it, if we don't have that, that contract's also void. It's not voidable. It's void because it's a legal component to that contract. So then we have voidable. And so the voidable piece, like the competent parties, yeah, the legal age, yes. Mostly I like to think of the mentally uh, competent piece. So I, I go back to Justin Bieber, right? Justin Bieber, when he was 13 years old, he had more money than, than all of us on this call. And he could buy any house that he wanted to. And what that would look like is that he could have backed out from the contract because of his age. So all the legal components, everything looks good. However, the age would have been able to make it voidable and he could have got out of it. When you see unenforceable, the unenforceable contract is really, I want you to think of like time. This one says verbal agreement. I also want you to think of time. Like maybe you have a, a home that you're having built and you were supposed to get bright white kitchen cabinets and they put in some kind of off-white kitchen cabinet. So much time has gone by since you noticed it and since you took action that it's no longer an enforceable contract because the time has lapsed so big. Valid, void, voidable. Valid means it has all the legal, the legal components. Void means one of the components is missing. Voidable, I want you to really think about age. Sorry, but really quick about the voidable and Justin yeah. Bieber. That was one of the questions on Kaplan and it was like, who can void it? And I thought that the, the seller could void it, but they were saying that only- It's the buyer. Yes. It would be the, the, right. it'd be, it'd be, it'd be the buyer, right? Because the, the, the buyer would be the voidable piece because it's the, for the most part, it's the age. And um, I just want you to kind of think about that. We're not going to really see um, a seller selling a house at, at 16 years old and deciding that they don't want to go through with it anymore. I want you to really think of it on the buy side. No, I thought like a seller would sell it to someone underage and then find out they're underage and say, oh, I, I don't have to sell it to you anymore. No, it's more of a, hey, I, I'm too young and you're taking advantage of me and I want out of the contract. So are all of these on the buyer side or? No, well, I mean, void void would be on anyone's side, right? Because maybe the, the, the seller, say it's grandma and the kids are just like, mom, you got to sell this thing because you had a great life and now we need the money. You need to move into a home or you can just move in, right? And then so she's not a, she's not a confident party anymore. Right. She's been bullied. She's under duress. And so that would make the contract, you know, void if we knew about it up front. It would be voidable if it was misrepresented, right? To where we think that everything was going well. And then it comes out to be later voidable. Um, so no, this isn't necessarily just on the buy side. The voidable could be both sides then, if it was misrepresented. Yeah, but for age, it's mostly on the buy side. Okay. Uh, Charles, if if yes, you sir. don't disclose the the lab based paint disclosure, if you don't disclose that, then the contract becomes void. Void because that is a legal component to the contract. It is federally okay. mandated that we have that thing. So if we don't have it, it is a void contract. Okay. So there's no thing. There's no such thing as terminate, right? If it's in the questions and it says terminate, void, and then two other answers then you would click void right terminate's not a real thing no yeah it's just void but when we're talking about the okay. legality of a contract it is void void okay cool thank you you're welcome so we got the statute of frauds right it says state that um we have real estate contracts must be in writing in order to be enforceable this would include leases for more than one year the sale of real estate and an option to purchase. So you guys might get a question around that, right? States um, that like Colorado, 
for the contract to be enforce enforceable, any lease that is over one year uh, long must be in writing. The sale of real, real estate must be in writing and an option contract must be in writing to be enforceable, which also means this. If we're wanting to change something, it also must be in writing. So if I have a written contract and then I want to change something, I can't just have a handshake agreement. Both parties can't be like Juan and I can't be like, hey, I'm like, hey, Juan, like, I'll, um, I'll do this for you instead of the other thing. And Juan's like, cool, Charles, like that, that works for me. And then we get to the finish line and Juan doesn't do it. And I'm like, dude, what happened? You're like, well, the contract says this. You're, you're sorry, dude. That's, that's how it goes, right? Because if we're going to change anything, we must put it in writing. If it's in writing, to change it also must be in writing. Then we have these different types of contracts. We have an executed contract. All promises have been fulfilled. So we're all the way executed. We have completed the contract. That is an executed contract. Executory contract just means that we're in the process of doing it. Like there's maybe a couple more steps to go before we get to the finish line. Executed, 100% done. Executory, we're almost there, but we have we got a couple extra things to knock out. When we have a bilateral, I just want everyone to think of any contract where both parties have to perform. All right, so if I have a bilateral contract, the buyer gives money, the seller gives a house. So it's like, it's bilateral. Yes, there's some pieces in between that both of us have to do. Unilateral just means one party. And I think a specific question that you guys are gonna get on the national exam is gonna be around an option contract, right? We see this option contract down here. And an option contract is this. It's basically saying like, maybe I didn't have my home for sale. And Alyssa's like, hey, Charles, I, I really want to buy your house. And I'm like, Alyssa, I'm not selling my house. And you're just like, no, I, I really want to buy this house. I'm like, I, and Alyssa says, well, listen, I'll give you, you know, X amount of dollars. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty good deal. I'd probably accept that. And so Alyssa's like, I just need to go get the money, though. I don't have the money. And so I agree to Alyssa that I will allow her to go get the money. So this is the thing. I can't sell the house to anyone else during this time. I also have to sell Alyssa the house if she gets the money. Unilateral. Alyssa never has to go find the money. I am the only one that needs to perform. I cannot sell it to anyone else. And if she finds the money, I have to sell it to her. She never has to go find the money. That's an option contract. And so that is unilateral. And I think you're going to see a question around that on the exam, that unilateral. Only one of us has to perform. It's always the seller. And they have said that they would do something, sell you the house and only you the house. So they can't sell it to anyone else and they have to sell it to you if you give the money. You never have to go get the money though. Unilateral. Did you just say it was also called an option contract? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the specific question you're gonna get is what contract is a unilateral contract and it's an option it's called an option contract is an mm -hmm. <laughs> an option contract is a unilateral contract yeah an option saying? contract is unilateral yes okay so is this one the one where it's um the buyer may or may not buy the house that would be related to this one okay yep that's unilateral yep they may or may not you have to perform mm -hmm. You have to sell it to them if they find the money and you're not allowed to sell it to anyone else and they never have to go find the money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So let's talk about listing agreements. We have the exclusive right to sell, which means that only this agent has the ability to sell this home. In their test question, this one has the most protections for the agent. I think that your test question is going to read, which one of these contracts has the most protections for the agent it is the exclusive right. So this could be the exclusive right to sell or the exclusive right to buy. I just have these up as listed sides. And the exclusive right to sell, exclusive right to buy have the most protections for you, the agent. And that's how the question is going to be worded on the exam. Only you can sell the house and only you will get paid. If the buyer goes and find, or the buyer or the seller goes and finds a client, 
They still owe you money. Then we have exclusive agency. This one's kind of weird because the other one, the, the buy side could read exclusive buyer or exclusive agency buyer agency agreement. Exclusive agency buyer agency agreement, which kind of looks like the exclusive right. And this means that you have to be the procuring cause. So if your client goes out and finds the buyer or finds the seller, they don't need to pay you. Another agent can't go and get the deal, but if the client goes and, and finds the deal, they do not need to pay you. So exclusive agency buyer agency agreement or exclusive agency seller agency, that is procuring cause. You get paid. Exclusive right to sell, exclusive right to buy. Most protections for you, the agent. Then we have an open agency. This just means, I want you to think of this, like you're driving down the street, there's seven signs in the, in the driveway or the, the yard, and the person stops at the fourth sign and they call that number. That's the agent that gets paid. All the other it's signs, the no one else. Do what? Uh, it's the open listing, right? It's yeah, that's the open, the open listing. Yeah, okay. that's the open listing. And if none of them find it, then no one gets paid. So this looks kind of like the exclusive agency, except for that if an agent does find the, the, the seller, then they are the ones that get paid. Then we have net listing. And I think the question is going to look something like frowned upon. It's legal, but frowned upon because it could um, have the, the agent act unethical. So what that looks like is that you're talking to the seller and the seller says, hey, Charles, I'm, I'm looking to sell my house. And I'm like, okay, awesome. Well, like, well, how much money do you need? And they're like, I need a net $500,000. And you're like, awesome. So if we were to sell your house for like 505, right? You would net that $500,000 because for some reason you bought the house and it was only 5K, I guess. I don't know. And you're going through and you, you figure out that dollar amount. And you're like, well, this is the thing. I'm going to do you a favor. I want you to net the most amount of money that you can. So I'll take this. And let's say that anything over you being able to net 500K, you let me keep. And that way I'll discount my commission to you. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. But maybe I know that the home's worth $600,000. And so we sell it for 505 or we have it listed for 505 to make them $500,000, but we sell it for 600 and I make $95,000 on my commission. If I know about it and that's unethical and it's against the law. So this, this is a legal type of listing, but if they find out that you did this to hurt somebody, like you knew something and you were playing games you're going to be in trouble with it. So this is a this is a, a, an ethical question that they're going to ask you. It's frowned upon because it could have you act unethically. Um, sorry about the exclusive agency. Is that um, does that have anything to do with like the agency versus the agent, or it's just agency? No, like yeah, it's know. just the agency, right? Like you and I have had this conversation around um, <laughs> someone helping you buy a house. Right. And if they don't have you, if they don't have a written contract, there has to be a transaction broker. Transaction so, broker. Right. So this is what we're talking about here is the actual agency contracts between the client and the agent. People who like, you know, signed and when um, it said paid only if broker procured the sale, but that just means that the seller could have sold it themselves but not another broker right correct another broker can't enter into this thing but the client could actually go and find uh either the buyer or the seller and if they do they don't owe you any money okay so the seller and um i forgot what i was gonna ask okay thanks cool you're welcome so then Guys, and so that, like that, that's 17%. And I think if you understand those concepts, this is going to be a lot simpler for you, right? Like those are the concepts that are going to be the big pieces of this test. So then we got financing. Obviously, the big thing is mortgagor versus mortgagee. The mortgagor is the borrower, all right? We give the note 
to the lender and they give us money. So we say, hey, lender, I need $600,000. And they're like, cool. What do you need $600,000 for? I'm like, I'm going to go buy a house. They're like, okay, what are you going to give us as collateral? You're like, I'm going to give you a note to this house. So if I stop paying you, you can take this home from me. We are the mortgagor when we are buying a home as, as a, not an agent, but as the buyer. The mortgagee is the lender. They're the person receiving the note from the borrower. So they are the mortgagee. EE is always the receiver. OR is always the giver. Always. So here are your three that you're going to need to know. Conventional. It's not guaranteed or insured by the government. Um, the lender sets the terms. The loan to value ratio is lower, which means that um, there, there typically isn't going to be PMI, right? If it's lower than the insured guarantee. So basically what that means is if the loan to value ratio is loan is 80%, and the value of the home, right, is 100. So the, the buyer is bringing 20% down, no PMI. Now, if the loan value switch to where it's a high loan to value ratio, so let's say it's 85%, 90%, but that means that the buyer is only bringing 10% down, 15% down, then that's a high loan to value ratio and there will be PMI. I think the PMI question you're going to mostly see on the FHA. So when FHA loan, it's an insured loan. The interest rates are set by the lender. The borrower pays an insurance premium and they're paying this insurance premium because the LTV is so high. They might be getting 95% of the loan and they only putting 5% down. So they are a riskier loan to the lender. And so if they default, the lender doesn't have a huge spread. And so, especially if we were to be thinking about like the current market that we're in, where these people were going like $100,000 over asking and the, and the home values kind of slowed down, where well, no one's lost money, but we haven't been seeing 18% appreciation over the last six months. It's slowed down tremendously. So if that loan to value ratio is high, it's a riskier loan. And if we have VA, I want you to think about a veteran. This is someone that served our country whether they are reserve or they're active duty, if they were injured, whatever that looks like, this is a very a guaranteed uh, by the government loan. It is assumable. Interest rates are set by the lender. The borrower is not charged uh, for the guarantee. And it takes an appraisal that is approved by the VA. And so as you're going through, like these are the three that you're gonna need to know. I think of conventional, higher, um, down payment, great credit, FHA, lower payment, and good credit because you can't have bad credit and get a loan. And VA, I want you to think of a veteran. Those are going to be your three that I think you're going to be quizzed on. And I think that if you have that concept, you're going to be fine on it. These other things, yes, you may get a question around it, but I don't want you to lose sleep over these bullet points. Mm -hmm. So here are your words to know. You're going to get a question around PITI. That's Principal Interest Taxes Insurance. And they're really going to say, what does PITI mean? And this is the answer. Principal Interest Taxes Insurance. When you get a loan, this is what's in your monthly payment. You pay the principal, you pay interest on it, you're paying taxes on it, you're paying, or you're paying taxes on the house, and you're paying insurance on the house every month. PITI. PMI, this is what we were just talking about. Like if you have a high um, loan to value ratio, you're going to have private mortgage insurance, which is an insurance that the lender's making you buy. So if you go into default, they get insured because they don't want to be hold, held holding the bag. They don't want to be caught holding the bag if you default and they have to foreclose on your home. Points. One point equals 1% of the loan, the loan amount, $600,000 purchase price, $500,000 loan, you're paying 1% of the 500, not the 600. You're only paying points on the loan, not the purchase price. I think your test question's going to say, what does paying um, points do? It increases the lender's yield. 
So they're making more money on the front of the loan because you're paying like $10,000, $15,000. So it lowers your monthly payment, but the lender's still making theirs because they're getting it all in the front of the, um, in front of the loan. Usury is really just where they charge you an astronomical interest rate. So when we're going through and we're thinking about um, like hard money lender versus a, like a regular 30 year mortgage, they can't charge us excess interest. That's illegal. So that's usury. A blanket loan is just when there's more than one property attached to the loan. Purchase money, I want you to think of owner financing. It's just another term for owner financing. So if you get a test question, which you may, owner financing, another term, or, or purchase, purchase money order is just another uh, way to get owner financing. We also have an acceleration clause, which is this. If we get hit with an acceleration clause, which is attached to the mortgage, that means that they want the entire amount due because we defaulted on the loan. And so if you miss a payment or two, they're gonna say, we're gonna foreclose on you. We're turning on the acceleration clause, either get foreclosed on or pay us all the money that you owe us. That's an acceleration clause. Alienation just means that if you were to transfer the, the deed to the house to someone else, the bank gets their money. So that just means that like this, if I were to sell the house that I'm in right now, the bank's not going to let me just keep paying over 30 years. Like, here's your money. Here's your money. Here's your money. They say, no, 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 no. We loaned you $500,000 for that house. You sold it to someone else. We want our money back. You can't just continue to make the monthly payments. And then defense clause, that just means that I paid off all the money that I owe the bank and they have to give me the, the full equitable, the full title back, right? So I'm getting um, the property essentially, like the bank doesn't have a lien on it anymore because I paid them back all of the money that I owed them. And then the practice of real estate. So we have the Civil Rights Act of 1880 or 1866 prohibits racial bias in buying, renting, selling, holding property. There are no exceptions. And so this is very important, guys. Like every, there is no exception, exceptions anywhere for any racial bias happening. We have Fair, Tight, or Fair Housing Act of 1968. That's discrimination of religion race, color, national origin. Then we have the Housing and Community Development Act in 1974. They added sex and gender to the Fair Housing Act, which is in addition to the Civil Rights Act. And then we have the amendment of 1988, which adds familiar status. That just means if we have someone living with us that is under 18 years of, of age, that is in our care, that is familiar status. And they also added handicap Handicap, this says this includes people with AIDS or alcoholics, but not drug addictions. All right. So if someone has a drug addiction, that is not a handicap. Alcoholism is. Drug addiction is not. So all of these layer on. So 1866, racial bias. Then they added on in the Fair Housing Act, the basis of religion, race, color, national origin. Then they added on sex and gender. Then they added on familiar status and handicaps. Here are some of the exceptions. And so you might get some questions around exceptions. Around age, if it is a community where 62 years or older, they can restrict younger kids from moving into, and I say younger, just younger people, because everyone has to be 62 years of age or older to live there. Then we have where at least one person in each unit is at least 55 years of age or older. And the, that's the occupancy of 80% of the community. Then they can say that we don't want young people in here. This is set for us. It keeps the cost of living down because most of the population buying houses isn't of this age. So these are cheap houses. Private clubs, if they restrict membership to people that are members, 
they can they can have some some discrimination, right? They can say that, like this person cannot be here because it's only for our members. Religious organizations can only say like, hey, they actually have to be a member of our congregation to actually buy this house and an owner occupied. If it's a two to four uh, family unit where the owner occupies one, they can say like, hey, I'm not comfortable with having, like it could be a female. They say, I'm not comfortable with having men live in these units. I don't feel safe. That's perfectly legal, right? We know that gender isn't something that we can discriminate against unless it's in this situation. And then single family house. Right. If the owner does not own more than three units at a time, however, no more than one unit can be sold and they can discriminate. But this is the thing. As an agent, you cannot discriminate. So this is no broker used. As a real estate agent, you can't sell a single family house and discriminate. We have higher standards than that. And as I'm talking about discrimination, I am not talking about race. Race is illegal you are never ever ever so if this religious organization says yeah i don't have this ethnicity of people allowed in my congregation that's against the law so they can't say that like this ethnicity of person cannot buy this house because we don't allow them in the church a hundred percent illegal and it says fair housing penalties they go in front of the administrative law judge which is the alj for your first violation, it's 16K, 37 on a second one, and then 65 in addition to any actual damages and attorney fees. You may get a question around this. I don't think that all of you will, but you may get a question around fair housing penalties. I would say it's probably going to be the 16K before it's going to be the second or third violation. It's going to be the one that they may give you, if any. Then we have some things that, in addition to Americans with Disabilities Act, right, in 1922 is protected from the discrimination of people um, for places and commercial buildings or multifamily of four or more units. So as we're going through this, you might get a test question around the American Disabilities Act, where it's probably around a landlord. And does the landlord have to go and like build a um, elevator? No, they don't need to go build an elevator. Do they have to allow the tenant to put in the, that safety bar in the bathroom? Yes, they have to. They have to allow the tenant to do that. They don't have to build an elevator, but they do have to allow the tenant to put the safety bar in. And the tenant's responsible for restoring it when they leave. All right, you're going to get a test question around that. No to the elevator. Yes to the safety bar. Tenant's responsible for fixing it when they leave. Megan's law is for registered sex offenders. When they're going through and someone has broken the law when it comes to children, they go in this Megan, they go in this, this report, this reporting system that says, I do bad things to kids. And it's Megan's law. And so it's registered. And then your people, if they don't want to live in a neighborhood with this type of person, like this is like high radar stuff for them. They can go on to this registration and go see where people live. We are not obligated to do this research for them. I highly recommend that you don't do it. I highly recommend that if someone asks you a question around it, you encourage them to go talk to the local authorities. Then we have the Equal uh, Credit Opportunities Act, which just means this. If someone has the money, we are not allowed to discriminate against them. We have to lend them. So if someone has a good job and they have the right credit score, we cannot not give them credit. Like they have to be allowed to. So you can't do it on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, none of that. If someone has a good paying job and someone has the right credit score and they apply for a loan, we must give them a loan. And this is the thing, like I don't want anyone to get um, when it comes to this, that's truly what it means good credit, right, or the right amount of credit and a good paying job that they can actually pay this loan back. Now, if there's someone that's on like food stamps, for example, right, like you're not discriminating them against because they're on food stamps. It has nothing to do with that. 
it is 100% around the effect that they have the inability to pay back the loan, all right? So as we're going through this piece, these are the things that you need to think about. It has nothing to do with food stamps or color or race or anything. Like if they cannot pay back the loan, then they will get denied the credit. Then we have TILA, Truth and Lending Act. TILA, which it has Regulation V in it, and it is a federally, uh, it's administered by the Federal Trade uh, Commission, it is created to protect the consumers for, with disclosures, all right? So they're protecting consumers around loans with disclosures. And two of the big things in here, acts provide for three days right of rescission, right? We keep talking about those three days. So if I go and apply for a loan, the lender has three days to tell me how much my loan's gonna cost. I pick a house, within three days, the lender says, here's the estimate. Then three days before the home closes, they have to tell me what the home is gonna cost me. If it's astronomically different than the estimate that they gave me, I have the right to walk away. That's what Tilla does. It says this, it's like, you did not tell them what their house was going to cost them with all the fees. And then you hid this until the last day. It allows them to walk away and get their earnest money back. Then it also has these trigger terms, right? And they're included in uh, the ad. So what this looks like is if I'm running an ad that talks about uh, get this house for $3,000 down or whatever, I actually have to put in all the qualifications right? Because not everyone's going to qualify for a great deal, right? Like that's why I say some restrictions apply because we want someone with great credit. They have to have all these different things. So if I run a Facebook ad or I run an ad in the newspaper or wherever, and if I am giving some great deal and I say, this is the monthly payment, I have to say everything that applies to, to be able to get that monthly payment. Everyone, right? That was like, that's north of 50%. That is north of 50% of the things that you're going to be seeing. We just touched financing, general principles, contracts, and the practice of real estate. I think that if you're going through this and you're able to get a working understanding of these things, all the other ones fall into place and are a lot simpler uh, when you go to attack this test. 